Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session that's uh, Data Preservation and Retention 101. Uh, thank you for being here, and welcome to this year's version of uh, the Software Developers Conference uh, put on by the Storage Networking Industry Association. And uh, a little bit about myself before we begin. Um, I've uh, been involved with SNAIL for quite a long time. I'm, I currently co-chair the Data Protection and Privacy Committee within SNAIL. Also involved with some other standards organizations that you see here, uh, IEEE, and um, in, in addition to SNAIL, and also a member of the American Bar Association, the Science and Technology Law section, um, primarily uh, focused on uh, legal issues that really, as it relates to, to privacy. Um, so have been a uh, security and privacy professional for uh, over 30 years in the industry and um, happy to be here today. So let's get started. So an abstract on what we're covering today. Hopefully that's why you're here. Basically we're gonna cover uh, preservation and retention. And uh, unfortunately those terms get used interchangeably quite a bit and sometimes incorrectly. So what we're gonna do is, is, is really define the difference between preservation and retention. We talk about some issues and considerations as it relates to preservation and retention. We'll also cover some guidelines, best practices, and then lastly, we're gonna finish with some key takeaways. Um, so um, grab a cup of coffee and uh, let's dig right in. So first, to define what a business record is. This is really gonna be important because if you take anything away from this session, it's really understanding that from a preservation and retention perspective, it's all about making sure that business records are what's preserved and retained. And it's important to define what a business record is because if it's not a business record, then you don't really have to worry about appropriate preservation and retention of that data. So let's start by defining what a business record is. And uh, an easy way to think about it is, you know, basically a record. And by the way, now that I've def uh, talked about business record, for the rest of this session, I will probably just use the term record. And you'll, you, you know that I will be talking about business record. So a record is a documentary material, any media really, that's created and received in the normal course, course of business. And, and there's specific pieces to that. Um, but by the way, when I say any media, that actually could even be paper. Now, in the context of this presentation, we're actually referring to and we'll be discussing digital data, not necessarily um, business records that are on physical paper. So keep that in mind because we have to set the appropriate context for what we're gonna cover today. So the business record is really, again, any documentary material and then the key is really the first subway that's worth preserving. It's either temporary or permanent, but it's worth preserving and because it provides evidence of the organization's policies, procedures, activities, decisions, and, and typically has some amount of technical, administrative, administrative, historical, and or some legal value. Um, and so, you know, sort of a tug-in-cheek example at, at the end here is that um, things may not, not everything may be considered a business record. Uh, a funny example is sort of the lunch menu example, um, which may not, you know, be not necessarily um, considered a business record and you may not want to have to worry about appropriately preserving and maintaining it from a retention perspective. Um, so this is really important. So it's really the basis for what we're gonna talk about today. So understand that when we talk about a business record, it's, it's really all the stuff that you need to preserve within your organization because it has value. And that value could be technical, administrative, historical, or, or maybe potentially some legal value to it or a combination thereof. So keep that 
in the back of your mind as we go through this. So, you know, what the heck is the big deal? And that's sort of what we covered already, but um, one of the ISO documents, this technical report that's mentioned here at the top, kind of an interest of what, interesting way of looking at a business record. And it, 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 as it defines it here, it's, it constitutes the business memory of daily business action. So that's an interesting way of thinking about what, what a business record really is. Um, so, you know, now that we know that business records are what we want to appropriately preserve and retain, then it's about why are we doing it? Well, we, we have to um, make sure that we're achieving regulatory compliance. We'll talk about some of those uh, regulations in a minute. Um, we want to guard against maybe some adverse litigation that may happen in the future. We'll talk a little bit about that. And, um, and, and basically, these are records that support, you know, the current and maybe some future management decisions that you may want to make within your company. Um, so to achieve this goal, the records have to be retained and, of course, appropriately preserved. And so that, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I think we've set the groundwork now for what a business record is, and what we'll do is we'll now cover data preservation and retention. Um, for the rest of the session, I will also typically talk about preservation, and I will talk about retention. Just keep in the back of your mind also that I'm talking about data preservation and data retention, and again, the context being digital. In other words, it's stored on media. So first of all, we'll start with uh, defining what data preservation is. And what data preservation is, is the process and operations involved in ensuring the ability to in read, interpret, authenticate, protect, secure uh, the data, but also the metadata throughout the life cycle. So, um, you know, this, this takes on a couple different focus areas. One, one focus area is, is usability. Well, we want to preserve data from a usability perspective, you have to be able to use the data, in other words, access it and all that. But there's also a focus area referred to as legal, and that is from a legal perspective, um, making sure that um, the data is there to address any um, evidentiary requirements in, in the case of potential litigation in the future. So th those are sort of the major drivers behind preservation at sort of a high level. We'll talk a little bit about regulations in a minute. Um, so keep that in mind. And again, I'll, I'll probably refer to uh, data preservation as preservation in and of itself as we move ahead. So keep in the back of your mind data preservation processes and operations as it relates to your data records. Um, now we're going to define what retention is. So data retention Think of data retention as really just the, the definition of the policies for meeting the legal and, and business needs. Um, and then it goes into preserving, obviously, the existence and integrity of the data for a specific period of time and, and or until certain events have tra transpired. So it's all about those policies around why we're going to keep the data and, by the way, how long we're going to keep it based on some regulations or maybe some other reasons that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, so, you know, a, an interesting thing about you know retention in and of itself is um, you're you're probably retaining the data for maybe a combination of legal and business needs um, or potential legal um, issues. You want to make sure that you're compliant for certain regulations that you may have to you're obligated to. Um, to um, be in control of. So we'll, we'll talk about what some of those regulations are in a minute. So um, an interesting example that we cover here is, you know, let, let's say that, you know, it's deemed that email is is not business records, which which is actually pretty unusual. But let's just, for a hypothetical example, you may want to keep email for six months, but if it's not a business record that you might want to then just eliminate the email uh, after a very short period of time. 
Um, if there is in fact an e-discovery event, meaning you are actually the the your company is is um, is presented with a um, a lawsuit and they go into what they call an e-discovery event. Uh, that means that you have to turn over evidentiary um, items, uh, and that incl may include many different things. So typically, what will happen is um, a legal hold will be placed on uh, all of your digital uh, data that's deemed business records, um, although it's, it's actually just about everything that they can grab, and then they're going to figure out later on if it's technically a business record or not. And they what they'll do, what opposing counsel will do, is actually search on specific uh, keywords based on whatever their whatever the lawsuit is is uh, is about. And then that those keyword searches will will pull up a reference of all these different records that could be associated or help them with the given lawsuit. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the backstory of what happens in an e-discovery event in terms of things get placed on a legal hold. When we say the e-discovery event overrides normal policy, that's what we mean is as soon as e and you're, you're hit with an e-discovery event, you are not allowed to uh, start deleting data, even if that was part of your retention policy. So go back to the crazy example of email. If uh, you said, hey, no, no, we're, we're deleting this email because that was part of our retention policy, which we have set in stone as our policy for this type of business record, which could be, in this example, email. Well, as soon as the um, e-discovery event starts, you're not allowed to, to um, delete anything. And, and that's what we mean by the overriding of, a, of your normal retention policies. So keep that in the back of your mind. So a little bit of, you know, the data preservation, uh, I'm sorry, prevention versus uh, retention. I can <coughs> excuse me. Think of preservation as everything to do with the processes and, and, and the setup and procedures of maintaining that data. And think of retention as the actual policies that you set for your company to maintain your business records for a defined period of time. So retention has everything to do with policies, and then preservation has everything to do with all the procedures put in place to do the preservation based on the policies that you set up. So that's a good way of, of um, keeping uh, in the back of your mind what preservation is versus retention. So a couple of interesting parts of preservation, a lot, you'll hear a lot about this concept of authenticity. So it's really, you know, a property of information's objects, content, and made it metadata that identifies that it's currently what it originally was and verifies that its contents hasn't changed. And that's really what authenticity is all about. So you, you have to have processes in place. How you do it, there's many different ways of doing this from a technological standpoint and almost from a, also from a procedural standpoint. But you, what you're doing when we talk about authenticity of the data is ensuring that that actual data, the content of the data, hasn't changed over a period of time. So, you know, what's involved, usually you have some verification process, making sure that it is the actual original data. There's some auditing going on of the access of that data. In other words, who's accessing it uh, when, sort of like a, an audit trail, if you will. And then um, a whole bunch of different ways of detecting change. You can do hashing, you can, you will typically set up audit trails, and there's a whole bunch of other ways of detecting change of these business records that you need to preserve. So some of the activities when we talk about retention are things like metadata management. So I've 
sort of mentioned the word metadata a couple of times so far. Metadata is really data about the data that you're storing. So, um, for example, metadata will, would be things like what's the name in the file, who owns the file, or the business record, if you will, uh, how big is it, when was it last accessed, and so on. That's really the, the metadata. It's sort of the description of the data. Um, and you have to, uh, it's important to maintain the metadata, just, it's just as important to maintain the metadata as it is the actual data itself. There's been some interesting uh, uh, legal disputes over the years that, that, that have gone to court that, that actually had to do with not necessarily the data itself, but uh, improper modification of the metadata to make it look like uh, something was done to the data when it really wasn't. So it's, it's really making sure that you do all the appropriate things for not just the data, but also the metadata itself. So there's other activities. There's discovery, there's classification of the data. Uh, that's very important, obviously. Control of information, how many, lo how many copies, where, what geographic locations are you keeping them in, versions, uh, if there's migration involved. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there's this concept of um, services, there's preservation, protection, security, availability, integrity. We talked a little bit about authenticity already. Lastly, the, the bottom middle one is disposition, disposition and deletion, and has obviously things to do with um, deleting the data. Uh, although when we talk about disposition, it's not necessarily doing an actual deletion of the data at the end. It could actually be do doing something else with the data based on policies that are set up. For example, it could be putting um, the data into an archive. So that would be an example. So some people refer to it as a, a long-term archive, and that could mean different things. It could be different types of media and so on, which we'll talk a little bit about a little later. So from a, a records management standpoint, when we talk about retention, you're really setting up a retention schedule. I mean, you know, once you have, as part of your policy set up, you, you uh, classify the data, but then you, for each given uh, set or, or classification buckets uh, for your data, you have to set up retention schedules and decide how long that's, uh, obviously as part, part of the policy, how long the data is gonna be retained and then what you're gonna do with that data at the end of the retention and then making sure that you're doing all the right things with that data throughout its life cycle, um, including at the end when, when you're either gonna delete it or um, do a, an appropriate disposition of the data at the end. Um, records management is, is, is a very important piece of the retention uh, life cycle. So there's other pieces of the life cycle processes. So there's a bunch of processes that at a high level, um, we would sort of classify it in the following ways. We would talk about, you know, first, uh, first, first off, you know, appraising your data. You know, what do you have, and how are you going to classify it? How are you going to stick it into multiple, multiple buckets? Uh, and then, of course, set up policies based on each of those respective data buckets. And then next, you're going to ingest the data. You know, you you bring it in in some digital form whatever that happens to be based on your uh, business environment. You store the data, you preserve the data based on specific preservation actions. And then of course, there's gonna be access of that data throughout its uh, uh, given lifetime. And then lastly, at the end of its retention schedule as part of its life cycle, you will do a disposition of the data at the very end. So what are some of the issues and considerations? That's sort of what we'll talk about next. Well, why in the heck is preservation a problem in the first place? You know, what's the big deal? And who the heck cares? So first off, you know, very often data preservation is at the bottom, not always, but sometimes at the bottom of the IT hierarchy, sometimes lacks adequate funding. Um, you know, very often this is not, you know, a, a quote moneymaker or, a profit center for a given organization. So uh, 
Uh, it's something that you have to do very often is because of legal uh, or, or some compliance requirements that you have. Um, and you're doing it, but you know, you don't really want to spend a lot of time. You don't want to spend a lot of effort. You certainly don't want to typically spend a lot of money doing it. Uh, and some people like to think of it as, you know, mit mitigating risk. It's almost like buying an insurance policy. And it depends on how much the organization um, is going to uh, consider what that in insurance policy or risk profile is going to mean to their business and how seriously they take it. So what are some of the drivers? Well, some of the drivers are relatively new and some of the compliance uh, things that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, some of those regulations and, and, and some of the legal um, uh, issues that, that come up. Some are, are quite new. In fact, some of the laws that have, have been released in the last few years, GDPR is a great example. The state of California just uh, at the beginning of this year, 2020, uh, implemented uh, or enacted into law in January of this year, uh, the CCPA, the uh, California uh, Consumer uh, Protection Act. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of new new regulations coming out all the time, both at the state, um, uh, federal, and, and in some cases, a, a global level where it, it might affect you as an organization, regardless of, of uh, where you do business or where you're located. Um, GDPR tends to affect, could potentially affect a corporation regardless of where you are because um, all you have to do is, is be retaining data as part of your business that is data that's uh, representing data of a European Union citizen. Well, you don't have to be a corporation that's based in the EU, the European Union, to necessarily have data that is um, identifying European Union uh, residents or citizens. So um, uh, that typically would then affect many companies, uh, including those that are in other countries outside the EU. So uh, those are some of the examples of um, where uh, the issues of uh, compliance actually could be very, very far reaching. The last bullet here is, is actually one that's often overlooked and that's the, uh, of why preservation is often a problem and that's the failure to collaborate. So a lot of organizations we find um, have these silos of responsibility and they don't necessarily talk to each other uh, either the groups or the uh, subgroups, and some might refer to it as the uh, line of business within an organization. Some people call it the business unit, depending on the structure of the organization, when they don't really com collaborate in, in amongst the different uh, groups within the organization, and that could cause some problems. So what are some of the regulations more specifically? I talked to, uh, about a few of them already. GDPR was one of them. You know, certainly in the, here in the U.S., you'll hear a lot about SEC, which is the Security and Exchange Commission. SOX stands for Sarbanes-Oxley. HIPAA is the Health Information uh, Privacy uh, um, Portability and Account Accountability Act. Um, FRCP is another financial regulation in the U.S. that has to do with financial institutions. But there's also some other um, potential uh, legal uh, requirements that you may uh, have uh, that you're required to deal with from an organizational standpoint. A good example is intellectual property litigation that, that might be uh, against your company. Um, from a corporate governance perspective, sort of on the other end of the spectrum, maybe outside of the regulatory space, you, you may have within your business specific internal requirements. So things like your your own IP, your intellectual property that you want to uh, obviously control and make sure that it doesn't get into the wrong hands from a competitive perspective. Uh, so you have well, you will have controls on the data that have nothing to do with external regulations at all. It could be just the fact that you want to um, 
you want to maintain and keep secret your your um, secret sauce, if you will, your intellectual property. There's other things like HR documents that that has all kinds of PII or personal identifying information um, and other documents as well that, that could actually be internal corporate governance and has nothing to do with external regulations. So from a practices standpoint, as when we talk about preservation, you know, it's important to understand what are the what are the requirements. And unfortunately, if you don't know and you're not sharing that information amongst the groups, that's not good. Um, a lot of the companies that we run across still rely really just on backups, and that's not good. You really want to have an entire preservation and retention uh, policy uh, architecture set up, and, and not just rely on a backup or two. Um, certainly, if you want to like record the tape and then worry about having to deal with things like losing it on a truck going to somewhere on a side of a mountain that's 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 uh that could be um, fraught with peril um, not to say that that's necessarily bad you know using tape as as a backup that's not the case at all it's just want to make sure that you have other um, preservation and retention architectures in place to make sure that you're doing the right things for all of these compliance issues that you have to deal with, which goes far beyond backups, which are typically done just to make sure you can restore in the case of a, a sudden emergency, be it either internal or external um, emergency like a hurricane or something. Some of the other issues that we see are, are, are issues of migration. So you have to migrate data very often, you know, if, if you have uh, disk media technology that is only good for a certain period of time, you have to be able to migrate from the older technology to newer technology. A lot of times that's not properly um, planned for, it's not properly configured, it's not properly uh, set up as policies and procedures to make sure that it is done seamlessly, but also making sure it's done so that there's no uh, interruption in service, things like that, to, to your organization. Um, and then, you know, uh, what are the 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 forces that that require that migration to happen in the first place? So, for example, if an application changes, well, whether or not that forces a migration, all of this must be planned. It's not that you know things don't happen. In fact, that's the problem. Things do happen. You just have to make sure it's appropriately planned for. We talked about collaboration a little bit earlier, and co collaboration is important from all of these different groups within your organization. It's only some are listed here, but just to give you a feel, legal, your records ma managers, and very often we don't use the term anymore, records managers. We used to call this RIM, records information managers. There are actually RIM departments within organizations. RIM is still a very common term used in the in the government space, um, but you know other groups like IT, business operations, that business and operations might be your line of business or business unit within a larger organization, for example. Then of course your security group or security uh, department, and either archi archivists, which is very, again very common, used as a department within or a group of people within government entities, not necessarily in the uh, private sector space, although that might fall under um, either IT or the line of business or the business unit uh, very often. Not always, but it, it'll change from organization to organization. Also changes from sector to sector uh, in terms of industry, depending on how important that, that is. So another question that comes up is, hey, what about data loss? So, you know, data loss is a, a huge, especially in the world of storage. Uh, you know, we could you know do a separate session just on this because there's actually a lot to cover here. But you know, just to skim the surface, you know, there's things like you know that I don't even have covered on the slides. For example, bit rot is, is a common one that we would talk about in the storage industry, um, and there are very 
common ways of dealing with with issues like that. Been around for many many years, so um, that issue has, and there's many different error correction type of uh, algorithms and technology to deal with with that. But the 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 main thing here is how much uh, data loss. When is it a problem? Making sure that regardless of what it is, how much it is, and when it's a problem, that you are doing the right things to properly preserve that data and then or the business records if you will and then also make sure that that data is not just preserved appropriately with all the right processes and controls but also that you're retaining it for a specific for a specific period of time all based again on policies you know how how long uh, do you have to retain that specific type of data or business record um, so from a security services standpoint, think about when we have talk about preservation and retention. Well, a lot of that, when we talk about things like authenticity and data integrity, uh, that's a, you know, that sort of falls under this whole heading of security services. And, and so some of those services are listed here. So identific identification and authentication services, you know, obviously it confirms the identities of users as they go to access access control. You certainly want to set that up for preventing unauthorized access to the business records. There's um, security service that's referred to as data integrity services, ensures that records are not altered or destroyed in an unauthorized manner. Manner, not that records are not altered, or not necessarily that they're just that they're not destroyed because they are. But the key being is that it's not done in an unauthorized manner, uh, because obviously you have you do have disposition of data, meaning it could be destroyed at the end, maybe. But this we're talking about data integrity services, making sure none of that happens in an unauthorized manner. There's also this concept in the security space of data confidentiality service. You certainly want to make sure that records are not accessed by unauthorized folks. And then lastly, non-repudiation service. Well, you want to make sure that whoever the engaged parties are cannot deny involvement, meaning you, you're, you're, you're actually tracking uh, the access to the data, modification of the data, and the list goes on and on. So that in the case of any type of question, litigation, whatever the case may be, um, it, it, it's non-repudiated, meaning you, you know, nobody can deny because you, you have that, uh, um, the logs and, and the appropriate um, history there to, to prove what's been done from an involvement perspective. So a little bit about best practices and you know, what do you want to make sure that you're doing? So from a retention perspective, um, we have this sort of a common term of you want to use applications that are preservation aware. And we used to use a term quite a bit, it's not used very much anymore, anymore referred to as ILM or Information Lifecycle Management. Uh, although the, the, the actual uh, technology is, is still used, we just very often don't necessarily call it ILM anymore. But you certainly want to make sure that you have um, applications that are taking care of the preservation and retention of the data that are aware of what that life cycle is. If you remember, we talked about life cycle earlier where you're actually classifying data, you're storing it, you're accessing it. At the very end, it's finally going to be um, appropriately um, dis dis uh, disposed of or, or deleted or some type of disposition. And you wanna make sure that the technology that you're using um, is, is doing all the right things from a lifecycle management perspective. Uh, certainly you wanna conduct the records inventory. Uh, you have to make sure that that's constantly adhered to. The interesting thing about you know the inventory too is um, making sure that that lines up with your retention policies because you need to make sure that the records are there 
for the life of the retention requirements of the data record or the business record. Um, so a couple of examples in the, in the healthcare space, you might see data that's required to, let's say, for example, medical images. Uh, in some states, actually, medical images of a given patient have to be re retained for the life of that patient. So you, it could be 80 to 100 years. Who knows? It just how however long that patient uh, lives. In some states and for some uh, regulations uh, in the medical field, certain images, depending on what the regulation is and, and geographic location and what state and so on, certain images can't be deleted ever. Uh, it has to be retained forever. So um, making sure that that inventory has the capability of uh, keeping inventory of that data for whatever that retention period is. Sounds easy, but that's actually a little bit uh, more complicated because you, if, if you think about it logically, it's, uh, it's okay to, you know, keep a record for a few years of, of what happens to a, to a business record. It's a much different thing when you're dealing with a business record that has to be around for 80 years or 100 years or longer in the case of forever. Uh, how do you deal with that? That's an interesting question. A lot of people will jokingly say, well, that's not going to be my problem because I won't be here. But uh, certainly from a business perspective, you have to uh, make sure that's appropriately accounted for and uh, do the appropriate uh, preparations to make sure it takes place. And lastly, you identify vital records, publish, and then educate and implement. You have to make sure that uh, not only do you set up the policies and procedures to make sure that you're doing all the right things for appropriate retention of data, it also must be adhered to through educating all the uh, uh, given groups within the business uh, to make sure it's properly implemented. And uh, the other thing that we often talk about, and I mentioned it earlier, is that, yes, metadata counts. Uh, you have to make sure that you're doing all the appropriate things from a preservation perspective on the metadata. Very often you'll see this term, especially in, in, in certain uh, industries, ESI or electronically stored information. Um, you know, that's one of the basis of this session is we're going to talk about, you know, data that's electronically stored or, or if you want to use the term digitally stored. Um, and you want to make sure that um, you have the ability to not just um, make sure that there is appropriate integrity for the data, but same thing applies to the metadata. Make sure that uh, uh, you, all those um, um, checks are in place to make sure that that data is not uh, altered um, inappropriately um, or uh, in an unauthorized manner. And then the, um, so the metadata is important uh, because you know, I think I might have mentioned that there's been some interesting um, litigation taking place in the last 10 years or so that actually had to do with um, not necessarily the data, but the metadata and, and the fact that it, it was not appropriately um, cared for or protected so that it was not, in fact, immutable like it should have been. Um, and there was some hanky panky going on where they were trying to, to modify the metadata to make it look like something it wasn't uh, from an access perspective. So uh, metadata is important. You got to make sure that uh, all the appropriate policies and procedures are uh, around metadata, just like just like the data. Uh, another thing that's important is the best practices from a a what, a how, and who. So, so what are the typical processes? Uh, I list them on the left hand side. You know, the, the, the these are the things that have to be set in stone in terms of you run through the goals and your strategy. You have to make sure that you have C level sponsorship. Uh, within your organization on whatever these policies and procedures are going to be, 
uh, from a preservation and retention perspective to make sure that um, you have the backing from your C-level um, executives. Uh, we've seen some interesting uh, happenings uh, in the corporate world in the last five to 10 years on um, based on certain litigation that's taken place where it's not just the C-level, but also the board level that, that uh, there's been some actions against those folks as well. So uh, this is actually becoming more and more of a hot topic as things go on, mostly because of some of the issues we've been seeing in the legal uh, realm as it relates to um, lawsuits, and all kinds of different litigation, um, and not just from the fact that you're not preserving and retaining the data just from just because of one if, given uh, legal compliance issue, sometimes it has to do with uh, other things like a data breach. And that, that's a whole other subject, which uh, we could probably do a separate uh, session on just that in and of itself. So some of the typical frameworks, there's many different frameworks that can be used to assist with setting up the appropriate policies and procedures, things like service management, there's information governance frame, frameworks to help with this. There's uh, compliance and risk reduction frameworks, infor information lifecycle management frameworks from multiple um, standards organizations that can be used to assist with setting up these appropriate policies and procedures for uh, retention and preservation. And lastly, the stakeholders. We sort of mentioned who some of these uh, players are in the past in terms of groups within your organization, IT, your REM or records and information management. That also could be, uh, if not that, it could be part of the business, uh, a specific business unit or LOB, line of business. Um, obviously, the legal department, your security group, finance, risk management, and the list goes on, actually. There could be other groups as well, but those are some of the more common ones. You also want to make sure that you're solving the disconnects. Uh, and this is, oddly enough, one of the, it seems kind of strange to even mention, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it again because it's really so important. That is that concept of this failure to co collaborate. Um, you really want to make sure that all stakeholders are within the organization and are assisting um, in setting the requirements and, and, and making sure that you have that that C-level and board-level commitment uh, to make sure that they are going to put all the appropriate resources in front of you. That includes not just people and, and bodies to, to move things or to set up technology appropriately. It's also making sure that you have the appropriate resources from a financial perspective. Uh, so it's not just having a couple of bodies to do this stuff, it's making sure that uh, there's a commitment to to setting setting it in place financially as well because that's not cheap as you can imagine to to do this in the right way. And and lastly, reducing complexity and this is um, very often a difficult one for companies and making sure that when you go through the classification process of of what are the business records you have and then how do I classify them, and what buckets do I put them in, you know it certainly is best if you can have less buckets. It's very difficult to have a small number of buckets in, in most industries, unfortunately. So certainly less buckets is best, and that obviously reducing complexity in that way, but whatever you need to be retained for whatever buckets there are, you, you just have to do what you can, but you try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, as As simple as the business will allow you to based on the type of uh, industry that you're in. And then of course, do all the right things from an implementation standpoint, and including deletion and disposition as appropriate at the end. Um, we find that uh, a lot of companies uh, get caught at the very end when they seem to be doing all the right things. They're, they're classifying their data, they're making sure that it's, um, that integrity is there, nothing's you know mucking with the data, nobody's accessing that, not allowed to access it. They're doing all the right things and what they're screwing up it on is at the very end, well what do I do now? I'm I've you know I've it's classified to be 
you know, retained for five years and I'm at the end of my five year period, what do I do? Well, it's making sure you do the right things at the end. And, and very often it is as simple as a, a deletion, but you have to do that correctly because it's not just doing a delete command on a couple of records, it's uh, applying all the appropriate policies and procedures to do the deletion, yes, but make sure that it's properly um, acknowledged and logged. So you have to be able to prove that not only did you delete it, but you, you kept it immutable for the period of time that it, it needed to be saved um, and making sure then that you did the right things at the very end. And it might be deleting and it might be archiving it to some other medium, be it optical or, or some other type of physical um, storage medium, could be tape, what, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, and making sure that that's done, but it's also making sure, well, can you prove that in a court of law later on that you did it? And oh, by the way, if you did do it and it's appropriately in a different place, uh, on a different media, because that's what your policies and procedures uh, dictated, um, prove that it is there. So um, very often there's, it's a matter of making sure that you can prove that you did all the right things and in the case of keeping things, can you can you appropriately retrieve that data at the appropriate time if asked to in a court of law? And believe it or not, that happens. And so uh, making sure that all the checks and balances are in place to not only abide by the policies and procedures, but make sure all the appropriate logging, classification, and um, sort of the, the checks of doing a check every once in a while, does, did that really work as, as, as planned? And can I really go through a, a process whereby I, I, I can prove that what I say happened really did happen? And uh, that's where, where a lot of people get caught up at the very, very end of the life cycle. So keep that in mind. Also a change in mentality. So in the old days for us old folks um, that can remember, it's that old archive mentality. You want to change that you know, to a retention and preservation from the very, very beginning of the data life cycle. Uh, so you know, think of, think of, uh, of it going from an event at the end, end of the information life cycle when we talk about disposition and, and really thinking about it as a requirement and a policy at the creation of the, uh, of, the, of the business record. So, you know, changing that mentality of, oh yeah, this is just some disposition, something I have to worry about at the very end. It's, you're actually gonna set up these policies at the very beginning of, of a given business record. And that will allow you to make sure that you're doing all the right things throughout the life cycle of a given business record. Um, oddly enough, it's, it's, it's something that uh, is, is almost an afterthought for those that haven't gone through the entire process. Um, and just keep in mind, uh, I made a note here at the end that this doesn't affect legal hold. So if you do have some disposition policies in place and you're hit with a legal hold, you're, you're not allowed to continue to do the deletions uh, during this legal hold process or what we call the e-discovery phase. Uh, those those uh, uh, disposition policies have to be suspended during the e-discovery phase. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So from, from, from a storage perspective, there's a lot we can talk about storage. In fact, we, you know, for because this is a storage developers conference, we, uh, we're, we're almost uh, obligated to talk about the actual storage media in and of itself. Um, you know, from a retention and preservation perspective, um, media is important because it's going to make sure you have to set it up so that it's making sure that you're protected from things like unauthorized access and loss and tampering, destruction and theft and all kinds of other things. Uh, you have to make sure that that media is physical and logically migratable. And then that also the media contains the right attributes. So if it's if it's got to be warm because it's you know it's it's for uh, immutability purposes, then you make sure that it's appropriately 
um, that technology is set up to appropriately um, support that, be it tape or optical or you know spinning disk or SSD or whatever the case may be. Um, and then from a compliant infrastructure perspective, you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate implement or management tools, you know, their compliance-based applications to do enterprise content management. Um, if there are huge databases, which many times they are, you want to make sure that all those applications are, are have the right management capabilities to do the appropriate uh, preservation and retention capabilities that you really need once you set up your policies. And then, of course, make sure that the storage infrastructure has the necessary retention and preservation attributes. Uh, again, it's got to be able to support security, confidentiality, and the list goes on. I must mention them all here. Um, we talk about self-healing storage systems, of course, hopefully eliminating the need for a true physical migration. You can do it logically um, and hopefully do it online so that you're not, um, you don't have any downtime. Um, so you want to be able to plan for that sort of migration and then also for obvious reasons make sure this is all auditable and monitorable so this stuff has to be uh, you have to be able to monitor and, and then have all the appropriate audit features available to main, maintain compliance so from a disposition and sanitization uh, perspective talked a little bit about disposition before so at the end of a retention requirement, you, there may be a need to dispose of the data. Uh, when we talk about disposition, disposition doesn't necessarily mean that you're destroying the data. It could be that you're, you're, you're archiving it or whatever the policy uh, states. Now, there are sometimes a need for disposing the data um, to the point where we call that media sanitization because you want to reuse the technology, the media, for example or you want to make sure that it, it's not able to be recovered by anybody else uh, and they refer to that as rendering access to the data as infeasible for a given level of effort that's what by definition what sanitization is if you guys are interested there's a great white paper that was written by the security twig within SNEA that i, I mentioned here at the bottom of the slide that'll go into detail on uh, sanitization and some of those capabilities so some of the key, key takeaways, um, certainly you want to preserve and maintain what's required by your business and legal requirements. So again, what, what are you retaining? You're retaining the business records and only the business records. Uh, and that's probably the biggest uh, takeaway here. We're always talking about business records and not everything necessarily. So then, you know, the next, uh, you know, you certainly want to create and adhere to the appropriate best practices. So you want to collaborate, you want to identify, classify, and set your requirements. The uh, processes and procedures are going to be very, very important in making sure that everybody knows them and that you're abiding by them. Lastly, this is probably also important, one of the more important ones is update and adapt. Uh, your business is going to be changing. Your regulatory requirements are going to change over time, whether you like it or not. You have to update your policies and adapt to those policies. And again, it's education, it's uh, retraining, it's making sure that collaboration is, is taking place throughout your organization uh, continually. So please take a moment to rate the session. Uh, we appreciate your feedback. We're always trying to do a better job as time goes on. We, we would love to hear from you. And uh, thank you for attending this session and uh, have a great day.